It's been a few weeks already that I attended this basement clearance of which I most prominently featured the IBM PC XT in one of my earlier videos already. It's only now, over a month later, that I finally get around inspecting all of these items. So with all of this retro stuff piled up, let's dive in and see what we've got here. Retro computing is the use of older computer hardware and software in modern times. I'm the vintage collector and these are my stories. So with all of this stuff here, it's uh, as usual the question was to begin with. So I managed to get three of those. It's ISA network adapters from Kingston, still with RJ45 and the BNC couplings. So this is a perfect fit for equipping all computers and making them network capable. So here we've got this 3Com Etherlink 3 adapter, also an ISA networking card with this additional socket for the AUI alongside with the RJ45 and the BNC coupling. And last but not least, I've got one of those. This is a parallel and serial port IO controller board for an IBM PC. I salvaged this and it has some wear here. Maybe need some cleaning. Don't know if that can be seen here. This has a little bit of dirt, but there is no rust. Overall, it looks in a very good condition after all. And next one up is peripherals. Well, absolutely fancy stuff is coming along. Here is a compact mouse. This is actually a MSF14, so actually it's a Logitech mouse uh, variation that will make a very good match with my compact Presario 425 the day that I finally will restore that thing. And I've got this other mouse here, Microsoft Home mouse with a serial connector. Uh, it looks in quite decent shape. Um, very nice, actually. There is some discoloration. Don't know if that's visible here on camera. This on the back side is rather bluish, whereas here the upper side has more like a greenish tint. But I think that's just the age which shows its signs here. Well. Sometimes stuff that you can get hold of, as we can see here, it's just the standard cables. We never can have enough of these. Typical 40 pin and 35 pin floppy and ID connected cables. This one here, uh, I don't know exactly what happened to this one. There is some goo inside the wrap. I don't know exactly. <laughs> I don't know exactly what this is about. Maybe I should unwrap it and see if this needs some quick cleaning because it surely doesn't look the way it should be. Oh, it's sticky, sticky stuff. I don't know exactly what this is but I'm pretty much sure this is not supposed to be here I shall give this a very quick cleaning after all as it looks quite disgusting and I don't want to store this in my cabinet And we've got this still in a wrap. Now that's interesting. It's a keyboard cable, but with one of those plugs that I used to fix the other keyboard that I originally got along with the IBM PC 5150. Uh, this one surely comes 
from an IBM Type keyboard. You see here. Can you read it? IBM. So this is sort of a keyboard cable. Doesn't belong to the one that I had fixed because that was a compact keyboard. But still, maybe I, this can be of some use at some point. And talking about peripherals, still here we've got uh, IOMEGA Jazz Drive. It's a SCSI version, though I am missing the power supply, which has a proprietary connector. So I will need to get hold of one of those power supplies as well. So next one up is floppies. Once again, I have an entire stockpile of floppies. Uh, I must be honest, I didn't check it out beforehand. I just grabbed it. So it's the traditional double-sided double density floppy disks that I can use for the older computers like the IBM PC or the PCXT, the K-Pro or even the Osborne. So some of them have annotations on the outside of the box, but I have no idea what's inside. Oh, oh, okay, but that's interesting now. That's that's interesting. Um, so what we've got here, just one second. I had one coming out of the sleeve, but this is in fact obviously original floppy disks by IBM System Support Program. 5363, hmm. no idea, dating of 1989, I would need to be looking up what these are supposed to be for, entire disk set, uh, maybe in this case bad luck for me because probably this is a disk set, the entire thing, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, uh, that I should rather salvage and not over format to be using them for other purposes. Let's see what's in the other boxes. Oh, here's some more IBM discs. Again. Oh, but also some random other stuff. This seems to have been an original IBM disc, but with some added label on top pity pity whatever it has been it's probably destroyed now um, some random floppy disk oh and here oh that's now interesting i wonder what's contained on there a logitech mouseware floppy disk logi mouse driver 3.3 that's quite old that's quite old oh my don't tell me you're really doing one of these overly boring hey look we have some floppy disks here videos again. Oh my, don't tell me you're really disrupting me. Again? Hey, what you doing there? Can't you see it for yourself? I'm disabling the pop-up assistant. Hold it, wait a s- So, and with him being silenced, I'm now having a boring look inside this almost pristine looking OS2 software box. Remember when I was teasing this in my video about the high screen Kalani computers that Vobis was bundling IBM OS2 along with their computers for the time in the period around 1994 and early 1995. Here we've got a very special OEM version of IBM OS2 Warp 3.0 which I believe is really a jackpot item. Speaking of IBM, here's another one of those classic early 1980s boxes which I could salvage. This is for the IBM personal editor. Inside the box there is even an original floppy disk. The right protection sticker is worn out, so I'm replacing it with a fresh one. The box itself looks quite okay-ish, except for this black goo. It's sticky rubber, which came in during transport. Unfortunately, I didn't pay attention that one of the laptops had deteriorated rubber feet, and so I just stacked things up. Let's hope I can rub this off using alcohol. Yeah, it sort of goes away. It's not perfect, but certainly looks better now. Shame on me. I really should have paid better attention to this. And look what we've got here. 
a 1530 data set for the Commodore 64. My C64 is equipped with both a floppy drive and an SD card adapter. I originally had a data set for it as well, but I had it given away many years ago. So now I'm having one again. Though in order to see this one working, I would need to fix the C64 and the keyboard first. But in the meantime, I'm turning to the Sony subnotebook. This little bugger here is the one with the deteriorated rubber feet, which left its traces on said IBM software box. And with the goo now being cleaned, I wonder if it still works. That's so cool! This machine really just kicks ass and still boots into Windows XP. Wow, this thing will make a very nice addition to my Sony collection. And while we are on the laptop topic, here's another one. A classic Mac PowerBook Duo from 1992, which comes complete with a floppy drive and the power brick. Here too, I have to clean the deteriorated rubber feet. Then for the moment of truth, will it turn on? Of course it will. Ok, I tell you, as this one had the power brick already, I could actually test this before, so here it was no big surprise after all. This one makes a very nice addition to my Macintosh collection, especially as I don't own too many Apple systems from the 80s and 90s era yet. And here is for laptop number 3, which is a Sharp PC 4500. So far I own a Sharp PC3000, which is more like a handheld style device and the PC4500 makes a good companion along. Also this one, aside from some cleaning, will happily turn on, though definitely needs some maintenance for the CMOS battery. As far as laptops are concerned, I'm not running short today. I had the chance to also pick this early 90s 486 high screen laptop which was sold by Vobis in the German European market. Actually, like many high screen machines, this is simply a white labeled OEM machine originally manufactured by the Nantan Computer Company under the FMA 3500 type designation. This machine came complete with a numeric keypad which is connected via 3.5mm plug to the laptop. Also, two power bricks were included, the user's guide and inside it I even found the original bill for this machine for which Phobis asked an astonishingly high 4799 Swiss francs in May 1992. Unfortunately, this machine won't power up, so I will need to drill down to see what's the matter here. Lo and behold, there's also some handheld style machines. Here's a compact handheld running Windows CE and it is still alive and kicking. And while we're at it, here's another one by the company which later acquired Compaq, Hewlett Packard. This is another Windows CE handheld, the HP 620LX. It needs some cleaning, as it had these deteriorated rubber bands wrapped around. Though after cleaning, I'm happy to see it also happily powers up. This almost feels like Christmas already, does it? And with this heavy weight, I'm coming back to the more luggable style portable systems. This is a Compact Portable 2, sporting a 286 CPU and, to my surprise, something over 6 MB of RAM. This machine was obviously heavily upgraded beyond the original configuration. And while it still turns on, it won't boot neither from the floppy nor from the hard drive. Also, the CMOS battery definitely needs replacement, plus there's some missing trim panels as well. But this machine is definitely worth restoring, I'm really looking forward for this journey. Again, a more compact machine, the SLT286 by Compaq. This one shows some heavy wear as well and needs lots of cleaning and repair. The power brick is missing, but as I have the SLT386, I borrowed its power supply to do a quick test. But it won't really power up. There is some signs of life, as this LED will quickly light up. But apart from that, there's no real activity and I will really need to disassemble this one here to get it back to life. 
Challenge accepted. Compaq also produced quite decent lightweight some notebooks in the 90s, like this Contura Aero 433C from 1994. While not as compact as the IBM Palmtop PC 110 or later the Toshiba Libretto, the Contura Aero had a similar form factor like the later mid 2000 netbooks. I took this one for parting out, as I have another identical and working one already, though. On second thought, it may be worth it for a deeper look if I could actually perform a full restoration. And here I'm finally closing in with the last one, which is the Compact Portable Plus. This is actually the successor to the Compact Portable and the predecessor to the Compact Portable 2. This machine again is in way better condition, it even boots off the hard drive. Though I noticed not all keys of the keyboard are responsive and also a rotary knob on the front side panel is missing. So maybe not a huge restoration but still work to be done here. And to conclude, here's a 1992 device, the high screen A5 PC, somewhat a thing between a palm top and a sub notebook. It looks very nice at first, but there's some broken off plastic parts and I'm missing the power supply. I tried powering it up from the battery compartment connectors, which sorts of powers up. I hear the hard drive spinning and also get some audible beeps, though the display stays dark. This machine, which is a rebranded Bicom B260i with a German keyboard, is quite rare these days and I do hope that I can bring it back to life. And this wraps it up for my look into a new stack of salvage stuff. This time many machines came in and this basement clearance from a few weeks ago was like a jackpot for me. I mentioned in my earlier September special that I could also grab this original IBM PCXT 5160. I also could have grabbed an original Revision 1 Northbone 1, but I had to let it go for monetary restraints. Still, it was not like that I couldn't grab enough stuff. I have many new machines waiting for restoration and some of them will surely make some interesting restoration videos along the way. I'm still somewhat recovering from the flu and trying to catch up again, so I'm still shifting in some other pre-produced content here and there. I'm working hard to conclude the CPM and DOS data exchange subject for the upcoming video before eventually turning over to the HP 110 portable machine and then ultimately diving into the AIM65 topic. Give me a thumbs up if you liked this video. As always, thanks for watching and see you next time. You're about to see some potential upcoming topics for future videos right now. Please let me know in the comments which topics you are particularly interested in. Of course, you can also drop me in some other topics you'd like me to chase down. Hello? Hello? Is anybody out there? Help? Please?